Good evening, and welcome to the Brooklyn Museum. My name's Lauren Celaya. I'm the Director of Public Programs here. On behalf of the museum, thank you. On behalf of the museum, I am thrilled to welcome you to tonight's conversation featuring three trailblazing leaders in our field. Natalie Bonwell from the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, Kaywin Feldman, representing from the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, and Brooklyn's own Anne Pasternak, Yes. All three of these leaders have done transformative work in our field, and it's truly an exciting and rare opportunity to hear from them each directly tonight. Uh, the three will engage in an earnest conversation around what it means to expand the historic missions of museums in the present day, grapple with the real challenges of doing so, and reflect on the ways museums create impact in our communities. We also want to hear from you, so you should have received a note card from our public programs team on your way in. Please jot your questions down here and we'll be around during the conversation to pick them up. Now before I introduce tonight's host and moderator, I'd like to thank our program's partners, Art Table, the Brunswick Group, and WNYC, our media sponsors who made tonight possible. And of course, a special thanks to Artnet, whose team has really done um, important work in reporting on women in the arts. And of course, the entire team at Brooklyn Museum, there are a lot of colleagues here tonight, from security, operations, audiovisual, visitor services, press, and our public programs team. A lot of labor and love goes into making these programs possible, so please express your gratitude to them on your way out. And now, to introduce our esteemed moderator, during her more than two weeks as a journalist, sorry, two decades, <laughs> Oh my God. During her more than two decades as a journalist, Allison Stewart has reported for all the major national news networks. She began her career as a producer and reporter for MTV News' breakthrough political coverage, Choose or Lose, for which she won a Peabody Award. She's also the author of two books, First Class, The Legacy of Dunbar, America's First Black Public High School, and Junk, Digging Through America's Love Affair with Stuff. Allison is also the host of the New York Public Radio show focusing on arts and culture called All of It with Allison Stewart, which is on weekdays, that's where the week comes in, from noon to 2 p.m. on WNYC. Please give a warm Brooklyn welcome to Allison Stewart. Fun. Hi everybody, good night, good evening. Hope you guys all having a good night. It's, it's interesting, on the, on the website, you, you probably all saw, because you got your tickets, it said this was billed as women leaders in the arts, but we're gonna take a slightly different tack. We're gonna follow, to quote Katie Sowers, the woman who was the first female football coach to reach the Super Bowl. She said, I'm not trying to be the best female coach, I'm trying to be the best coach. I did want to take a few minutes, though, to have a little bit of a, a get to know you portion so everybody knows who's on stage and, and where you've all come from. So, Kaywin, first of all, I have to ask about your name. Kaywin. I'm actually embarrassed now. I actually don't have a good story. My parents knew somebody else with the name and decided they liked it, and so they copied it. I think the other couple had combined two family names, but. Um, and then they didn't give me a middle name. They decided Kaywin was enough, and so. You have a, an undergraduate degree in archaeology. How did you go from archaeology to art? Uh, the uh, degree is in classical archaeology, and so uh, Greek and Roman, and I studied at the University of Michigan, where there is no Greek and Roman archaeology. There, there's <laughs> museums, but... Um, and so um, I decided that I wanted to have some experience digging, even though it wasn't required with the degree, and so I spent about five or six summers uh, digging in central France in a late Iron Age, early Roman site. And as part of that, I then decided to work my way around the uh, former Roman Empire by myself, just took a backpack, and um, I was 21 years old, and um, had all sorts of life-harrowing experiences um, that helped make me the leader I am today. I learned about decision-making when it involves your own life. It's pretty serious. And um, through the process, I had a life-changing moment at the Scrovani Chapel. And this um, encounter with Giotto's frescoes uh, changed everything, and I became an art historian. 
when did you realize in the course of your career or your life, and I'm gonna ask you all this, um, the power of art for social change? Well, I'm, uh, actually, it was my experience um, when I uh, saw the Scrivani Chapel. Um, I arrived uh, in um, Padua at the end of a very long journey, a three-day train ride through the former Yugoslavia, locked in a train compartment with um, four French boys and young teenagers. And it, it made a long uh, trip, and there was an Italian train strike, and we were thrown out at Trieste, and um, I finally made my way to Padua at the end of a day, and I was um, tired and hungry and hadn't had a shower in a couple of days. And I sort of thought about taking a break, and then I thought, oh, no, I've got you know an hour before the chapel closes. And so, um, uh, and I tell that story because I think um, feeling sort of at my lowest ebb, um, both physically as well as emotionally after all that I'd been through, meant that I was very raw. And in the chapel, um, I realized today what I experienced was a feeling of wonder. And I was overwhelmed by the extraordinary beauty of these 13th century frescoes. And I've since done a lot of research on the topic of wonder. It's an area of interest of mine. And um, social scientists have done um, a, a lot of research and testing and shown that when people feel wonder, and it can be wonder because you're standing in front of the Grand Canyon or you're at the Scrivani Chapel or you hear a speech by Dr. King, whatever the trigger is, but, but when, when we experience the feeling of wonder, we actually become less narcissistic. We stop worrying about ourselves, we stop looking at our phones, um, and um, we, become, we realize that we're connected to something bigger than ourselves. It's that feeling of a shared humanity, and um, humans are actually um, more generous, they're more likely to volunteer and give of themselves when they experience wonder. And so um, that's what happened to me in the Scrivani Chapel. And despite everything I'd been through, I walked out of that chapel just on air. I was, I was reconnected with a world that I loved and believed in uh, because of the, the power of, of art. Natalie, when did you realize the power of art for social change? The power of art? Um, I would say um, the importance of uh, art. I think that there is a moment uh, uh, very important for me. It's, uh, I was, I, I just, I lost my father. It was very brutal. And uh, I was, um, uh, just when I learned like, uh, this, I was in my garden and there was an extraordinary tree, a liquid en bar. And it was with fabulous colors during the fall. And I was so sad, but at the same time, I realized that I was able to appreciate the beauty of what I was seeing. And I understood immediately that art and this aesthetic emotion was much more stronger, in fact. And maybe this is why I do a lot of art therapy in my museum. When did you realize, Natalie, that art would be your career? I think it's not just about art. It's about our emotional intelligence. It's about our emotion. We talk a lot about our cognition, about our intellect, brain, artificial intelligence, but I'm much more interested by emotional intelligence. And in fact, uh, we are animals, and sometimes we overreact because of our emotions, because we cannot handle our emotion. So I think that museum and art, music, theater, whatever, help us to be connected to our emotion, mm -hmm. and because we are not robots, but we are human, so uh, it's very important to understand and to communicate thanks to our emotional intelligence. So for me, it is absolutely essential if we want to be 100% uh, human, not just computer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we all know you've been at, you were at Creative Time for 20 years. Some magnificent, you know, parts of pieces of art that will be in our lives forever. You helped create. So that's a pretty good gig. What made you leave it and come to this, this job? Well, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, who wouldn't want to 
be at the Brooklyn Museum, frankly. Uh, but I would say that I had this moment, you know, Creative Time, for those of you who don't know, is a really mighty little organization based in New York that helps artists realize their dream public projects. And um, I had, and we really care about this intersection between art and social change. And I had this experience where my friend Glenn Lowry, who's the director of the Museum of Modern Art, asked me the day after the Charlie Hebdo massacre if I would organize a panel at MoMA about the events in Paris. Well, why on earth would he ask me to do that? He has a giant staff there. And there are a few answers to it. One is that he figured I'd have some good ideas. Two, I wouldn't be weighed down by any bureaucracies. And three, if it backfired, he didn't have to fire me. He could just like, a staff member, he could just like, you know, throw me under the bus. And what happened was, um, you know, Creative Time had this, uh, still does, has this conference called the Creative Time Summit. And we have about 100 partners worldwide that have their own mini summits at the same time as the summit in New York. And, um, you know, we work on it year after year, all year round, and about 10,000 people watch it live online. At MoMA, <clears throat> this panel, they couldn't even announce that they were going to broadcast it live because we were waiting for one of the panelists, a comedian named Asif Manvi. Do you guys remember him? He was the Middle Eastern correspondent on The Daily Show. And he just wasn't responding whether he was going to give the permission to let us live stream it. So he shows up like every celebrity 50 seconds before the, the panel starts. And I was like, Asif, can we live stream it? And he said, sure, but MoMA had not had not um, announced that they were gonna live stream it. And you know how many people watched it live around the world? About 10,000. Mm -hmm. And I thought, as much as people like to cl complain about their institutions, in truth, they really care what happens there. And so when the board of the Brooklyn Museum asked me if I would be interested in coming, I thought, if there was ever a museum that was passionate about this connection between art and social change, it's the Brooklyn Museum. And if I had a bigger, operation platform to work with, what kind of change could we impact in the world? That was a long-winded answer, I'm no. so sorry. <laughs> I work in public radio, we like, we like full sentences. Um, <laughs> you got them. <laughs> <laughs> when you took on this role, uh, one of the articles I read announcing, announcing you in this role has the funniest line about you, it said, Pasternak's emergence as a persistent radical within the museum world. Why is it important to be radical now? You know, Darren Walker of the Ford Foundation said something very compelling recently. He said, America is in crisis and therefore our museums are in crisis. Or it was something, American museums are in crisis because America is in crisis, right? It is, there's so much pain in our country, in our city, in our neighborhood, in our world right now. Mass inequality, climate devastation, you know, the shortcomings of uh, our challenges to democracy, mass migrations, the list goes on, mm -hmm. right? Great inequities. And it's about time our cultural institutions leaned into them and did something proactive about them. We're among the few public institutions that people can rely on or should be able to rely on to come together for learning, for conversation, for debate, for even argument. That is such an important democratic function of what we all do. And I think it's just really important that we keep pushing our institutions forward. And again, if there was ever an institution that that was a part of their, its DNA, it's the Brooklyn Museum. Natalie, you mentioned this uh, earlier about the use of art therapy and, and how much you believe in it. Can you tell us about the work that you're doing around art therapy? Um, in fact, uh, the Montreal Museum of Fine Art is uh, a pioneer in this uh, field because uh, not only we work with uh, 450 associations, so it's a lot, but also we have an art and health committee uh, which is presided by the chief scientist in Quebec. So we have very, very high profile uh, people from the CNRS in Paris, from the Cornelius Foundation in London, etc. And uh, we have uh, not only just art therapy, but also a pilot project about Alzheimer, um, eating disorders, 
and which are followed by um, through um, scientists' protocols and investigations. But I think that uh, there is something which is rather uh, unusual. It's the first premiere in the world, by the way. Uh, we have the medical museum prescription. So if you go to see your doctor, you, know, you can receive a prescription. And we do work with the Association of the Francophone Doctors in Canada. And this is a world premiere, frankly. And so I think that is so important because for all of us, because you are here uh, in this museum today, uh, it's obvious for all of us that art is important and powerful. But for so many people, it's not as obvious. Mm. And so for the doctors, when we discuss with them, they understand that they give another tool to their patients. And I can tell you that it works very, very well. It works so well that we even receive a special grant from our um, uh, medical health uh, minister. So it's uh, truly uh, avant-garde. And now what I want to do is to bring this museum medical prescription in the whole province of Quebec and of course in Canada and maybe here in the United States, I don't know. <laughs> Hope so, please. <laughs> Okay, when you were in Minneapolis, you had something called the Center for Empathy and Visual Arts. Could you tell us about the work that you did there? Yeah, and I'm, I'm delighted to say that it is um, very much continuing um, today. Uh, so the uh, Center for Empathy really came out of um, some of what I was talking about earlier about the feeling of wonder, because wonder and empathy are um, very closely allied, because again, they're about uh, connecting with humanity. and um, we uh, grew really interested in thinking about how, um, uh, how the museum might actually work to further empathy uh, for other people in society. And the Museum in Minneapolis has an encyclopedic collection, a, a general collection. So um, lots of works of art across cultures and time to deal with. And um, the museum partnered with the Greater Good Science Center in um, Berkeley, uh, where they were actually uh, social scientists doing research about um, empathy. And um, just as I was leaving, they were developing a great uh, tool that could be used to actually test um, people as they arrived at the museum, and then again afterwards to see if we were moving the dial at all. And so there was an interest in working with um, children, teenagers, and adults, and also an interest in uh, sort of the formal tours that we did of the museum, whether that's on a school tour or, a, or an adult tour and also just the casual visitor who happens to walk in. So we sort of divided up all those categories um, with the tests to sort of figure out. The hardest part, of course, is what happens three months after a visit. You know, was, did you feel more empathic at that moment in the museum, and then did it leave? And um, particularly because so much of the work was dealing with children, it's hard to um, stay in touch with children and track them um, farther on. So that was sort of the next phase um, for, the, for the work was to figure out how to do longer term testing, but um, that was sort of the initiative. When you think about a museum's role in terms of wellness, art therapy and empathy, is there something that we haven't explored or something that you think might be interesting to explore that may sound crazy but could really work? Something you've been interested in? Anybody? I think that uh, having like, uh, the, um, those connections with our animality and uh, having more uh, close connections and even bridges with uh, natural history mm -hmm. uh, or uh, sciences museum uh, could be uh, very interesting because now like, uh, our knowledge is not so much top-down. Like we think in our new century on a more horizontal level. And I think that uh, this kind of uh, intersectional or uh, interdisciplinary uh, method and even thought would be very interesting. And art and sciences are really, really should be even more connected on different, not just for art therapy or medicine, but on many other uh, fields. So that would be uh, something new. In fact, I work on a Darwin exhibition with Natural History Museum. Darwin? Yes, and uh, Art Museum. So this is this kind of uh, 
a cocktail, donc, uh, which could, will be very innovative. And I must say that it's, it's a great adventure because uh, when uh, first uh, I proposed to my board to have this art and health committee with science, uh, scientists, my trustees didn't, were really not convinced. They say, why do you want to bring scientists in the museum? Because uh, you are a little bit far from uh, your core business. But now look, we can see that uh, it's uh, becoming more and more obvious. So uh, working with uh, Natural History Museum, even with zoo, because I think that the zoo will be uh, the museum for the next generations, because there is such a big challenge with the uh, biodiversity extinction. So all kind of uh, works we can do all together look, uh, will be uh, very relevant and even for our next generations, because we'll be uh, criticized for what we are not doing right now. So uh, I think that uh, there is a, a great path for the future. That's so interesting. Yeah, and you know, it, I, I think we all share a commitment to thinking about impact. And you know, there are many areas that we're all invested in impact. And one of the things we ask our, our we ask ourselves here is how do we um, help support a vibrant, vital local community, especially a community that has so many um, rich cultural traditions and also some real challenges with gentrification, et cetera. How do we really support um, equitable schools and green spaces and affordable housing and job opportunities? So these are, these are things that we're really actively working on at the Brooklyn Museum, which you may not think is a traditional role for a museum. But we feel fueled by our community and we want to give back to our community. And when we do well, our community does well. When our community does well, we do well. So that relationship is extremely important to us. When you think about your roles as leaders for, your ver for your, each of your institutions, when you think about your digital strategy, what does that look like? What's important? What's important in terms of for the, the institution itself, but as we're talking about the institution as it relates to the community and its users and clients? I'll, I'll jump in there um, with storytelling. I think we're all uh, with museums trying to become better and better at storytelling and um, our institutions, our <laughs> repositories of the most remarkable content so it's the collections that we have, it's the research that um, curators and scholars do, and the rest of our staff are experts in all sorts of areas of the work that they do. Um, we have incredible libraries. Um, uh, our conservators have remarkable research that they do. And one of the things we're trying to figure out now and get better at is to tell those stories because um, one of the trends um, in society that I really love is the championing of the geek. You know, we, we geeks are cool again. <laughs> and um, we're filled with geeks and um, have so many great stories. And so I think we're all trying to be better storytellers, whether that's through blogs and videos and um, perhaps thinking about exhibition catalogs a different way, um, certainly through websites and digital and then also in the galleries and um, with people's phones in their pockets, how we might actually connect them more with works of art? For me, I think that we spend our day in front of the screen, and frankly, there is something I don't want people to do in the museum is to be in front of the screen. I think that, uh, you know, that when you are in front of the screen, a screen is also a wall, and your empathetic brain does not react in the same way when you are in front of a screen. There is not the same kind of exchange in terms of uh, uh, chemistry. So uh, when uh, you are in a museum, you want to avoid this digital virtual reality and you want to experiment art life. You know, it's like to make love with someone. It's a very different experience when you are with someone in your hand, you are, okay? <laughs> I'm wondering more. where you're going with that, Natalie. <laughs> so, I think that the museum is the place for art life, and in order to have this strong and true, genuine emotion you know, connection. 
You Hi. know, I, I would just say um, that you, you can use technology to strengthen those connections too. So for example, thanks to um, the Bloomberg Foundation, we have an app called Ask. And so you can be anywhere in the museum looking at an artwork and you can immediately text an art historian on staff and ask them any question whatsoever, which has been great. Um, not only for our visitors to learn more, but also for us to understand what are our visitors interested in. So it changes our wall labels, inspires exhibitions, et cetera. It's a question for all of you. What was uh, something that you came up against that proved to be very persistently stubborn? Something that you want to change, something that needed to be fixed, something that needed to be altered, and it didn't look like you were going to be able to do it or lead your way through it, but you ultimately did and I want to know what the solution was, what the problem was and what the solution was. I have a good story. <laughs> okay, I have been attacked for cultural appropriation, you know that. So, uh, in fact, uh, we had uh, one uh, costume, a beautiful dress uh, imagined by Jean-Paul Gaultier. In fact, we had this exhibition here at the Brooklyn in 2013. And uh, in uh, our exhibition, it was in 2017, and uh, there was a fair, uh, an hairdress with feathers inspired by the indigenous um, uh, culture. And uh, well, the Francophone did not react because uh, in France, and especially for Jean Paul Gaultier, he understand nothing about the cultural appropriation. But of course, the Anglophone neighbors, they understood very well, and especially in the newspaper. So, uh, my uh, problem was, or donc, I had to uh, remove donc, uh, this uh, um, hairdress, which I didn't want because I don't think that censorship is uh, didactic. We, we cannot explain anything when we hide things. Or donc, we can do nothing, which was not also a solution. So, in fact, uh, I invited Someone you may know now in New York, it's a Mischief Eagle Testicle by Kent Monkman. You saw maybe the commissions which are in the main hall of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So he's an, an indigenous artist and he has an avatar, Mischief Eagle Testicle. And in fact, we organized the wedding between Jean-Paul Gaultier, who accepted, even if we understood nothing, but he's very kind. <laughs> With, Jean, with Kent Monkman, and they can't imagine an artistic performance which became, in fact, a work of art. And that was a wonderful answer to uh, a huge challenge uh, with a lot of humor and uh, thanks to artists. Kaylin, what was an opportunity that uh, you had I to think, um, thinking again back to um, Minneapolis, um, uh, while I was there, we were thinking a lot about uh, trying to reinvent membership, and it's something that um, we, you know, in the field often talk about. And, um, you know, with variation, most studies of museums, particularly outside of large metropolitan areas, show a general decline in membership um, across institutions. Yet, people care about art museums. Um, uh, attendance is often up at some of the institutions where membership uh, declines. And, um, and we also look at, at performing arts organizations where people don't buy as many season tickets. They still go, but perhaps they just behave differently. So the, the, the challenge was the different behavior, particularly among younger audiences. And um, they still care about the institutions and they engage, they just engage in different ways. And so trying to think about was there a new model for um, membership and our sort of bigger concept was we wanted more people under the tent and um, we wanted to um, know more about what people, what they um, attracted them to the institution, what they liked doing, and then we could be more responsive uh, with a, the sophistication of, of uh, databases now, we could actually tailor more of our communications to particular interests of people and um, try to engage them in different ways. And so that was um, really a, a complicated issue and one that um, uh, the museum ended up responding by creating um, a, a free membership at the institution and, um, and, and developing a much more sophisticated uh, customer relationship management system so that as we had more people participating in lots of ways, uh, that we could understand their behavior better and 
um, communicate with them in ways that reflected how we understood their interests. And um, I can't say that we solved it perfectly, but that was um, a, a, a one that really occupied a lot of, of, of the time. How about for you, Anne? <laughs> Like, how There's long you so got? many. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, we had a very um, big controversy over a hire for an African arts position. And no matter how I felt about, you know, misinformation or about the situation, at the end of the day, um, there is no denying the very profound uh, impact of structural racism in our society. And so, you know, when the controversy hit, one, we had to li really listen to community and understand where they were coming from. And then two, I really, before we released a, a big statement about our thoughts, I had to, it was, a, it was a real challenge for the entire team. We all had to come together and talk about our different views and thoughts on this and come up with a joint statement. Because if we couldn't agree as a diverse staff, then how could we possibly release a statement? What would the implications mean? for us as a team. And, um, and then we decided that we really were committed to doing better. Um, that this was an opportunity for us to continually increase, uh, much more I would say ambitiously and aggressively, our works around what we call idea, inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. And so um, it really helped us line up paid uh, internships and programs with historically black colleges and universities, CUNY system here in New York, including um, our local college of Medgar Evers. Um, it really helped us really think about mentorship and pipeline training. So there's a whole bunch of things that we've been doing as an institution to really uh, not waste that opportunity and to really lean, it, lean into it and rise to the occasion as best as we can. It's interesting, I heard both Anna and Kay when you the, I think you just said the, about the behavior, sort of. You wanted to know about the behavior of, of people coming to the museums and, and what they wanted. What's been standing in the way of people in your positions from understanding the behavior of the people who come to the museums and want to participate in the museums? What was in the way? Part of it is the complications of, of capturing data, which um, just becomes easier and less expensive as time goes on. The, mm -hmm. the advancement of technology, we're able to grab data more easily. We're probably asking more questions now as well, so having more interest in it. And, um, and I think that one of the changes is that we all recognize now that um, as society is, is changing at such a, a fast pace, that our public out there is, is changing also. And, a, a few years ago, um, I was talking to a, a reporter about some, it might be that membership initiative, in fact, um, in Minneapolis, and she said, well, I don't understand. It seems like you think of your visitors like they're general consumers. I said, well, they are. They're the same people who go to Target and who go see movies and go to the grocery store and turn on the TV. That, that, those are the same people who come through our museums and that, that pace of change, and I, I think that we're all working really hard now to try to understand that, that pace of change and our, our role with it, but have better tools to understand now. And I think I have a less polite way of framing it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> surprise. Um, I, I think that our institutions were historically closed off to other voices. We didn't have diverse boards and staffs. We didn't have diverse programming. We had experts who shared with us what they thought we needed to know. And we know that that model is not sufficient, it's not even acceptable. And um, there is extraordinary joy in doing work that includes far many voices and experiences in the work that we do. And in fact, this is why uh, the museum definition, which is now discussed at the ICOM, okay, should include also two words, inclusion and well-being. We're coming up on, I've got about 10 more minutes to ask questions and then we're gonna take questions from the audience. So get your cards ready and maybe our friends can sort of start collecting them. All right, here's the paragraph we've all been waiting for. 
When academics look back, it's possible that 2019 will be remembered as an inflection point in the history of museums and their relationship to money. Over the past nine months, major art institutions, and more specifically, the people who fund and run them, have come under unprecedented scrutiny. Everybody has an opinion about this? People very strongly in their opinions about boards and how people make their money. On the issue of boards, the top three sectors for people on boards are banking, real estate, and then energy, oil, and gas. Defense and pharmaceuticals, actually, believe it or not, down at the bottom. When you read stories about this, when you see news reports about this, when you're asked about this, we read about it a lot in broad strokes. What's a nuance about this issue that you would like people to know and understand that's, that is getting lost in the conversation? Well, I would say there's no nuance in the conversation, and that's the problem. Um, I think that we're quick to demonize people and uh, not understand um, the results that we're potentially having on our institutions. Do we want our institutions to be weaker or do we want them to be stronger in this environment? And what would that look like? And you know, the whole history of philanthropy has been called um, bad people doing good things. I don't believe in that. Um, I happen to actually love and respect my board uh, very, very much. Uh, but I do think that the history of um, institutions where it's universities, hospitals, museums, you know, operas, you name it, um, is um, complex, but our discussion has not been complex. And I think that's a problem we need to, there are no neat bows, and we need to um, allow for real conversation and real difference of thought. And if we can't have difference of thought, I worry about uh, what hope there is for all of us. I agree because uh a museum is really a place for the, this democratic conversation, uh, this democratic dialogue. And uh, in fact, uh, what you say is um, so true. Uh, and we cannot judge the past with our own values. And so it's important to keep this complexity because democracy is the organization of the deep complexity. And of course, we, we have to hear like, um, all kinds of voices but those voices also must hear look, the other one. And this plurality of uh, opinion is really the essence of our democracy. Look, we must accept that people could have different opinions. And museum can be those safe space for this democratic dialogue. I do agree with you totally. I'll throw in two things. One in the nuance category is that um, in talking about philanthropy, particularly of late, um, we don't seem to have any space to talk about the um, extraordinary benefactors. We all have stories and could probably weep over them of people who have come forward to support our institutions because they believe in the mission, because they believe in the impact that can be made on lives. And we uh, say, we all have them. Our lives and, and careers have been touched by extraordinary people and it's a gift that's been given to me that I've been able to know these people and um, have been inspired by their generosity and commitment to good and so that's what I would put in the nuance category but I think the other story that we're not seeing in the press is um, a real examination of the whole funding model of our nonprofit organizations particularly speaking from my own experience in, in the arts and um, uh, you know, our, our whole model in art museums has been constructed that we have to always grow. You know, every year we're asked for attendance numbers and for works of art and the ideas, and so often with our, um, our, our boards and, and the people we answer to is the idea that we, everything is about growth. And as we keep building buildings and, and acquiring more art, and then that means more staff to, um, to work as registrars, to photograph it, to, uh, work on the digital side and our educators, we've grown so large and there's actually no model for shrinking at all. And, um, and our financial models are built so substantially on, on philanthropy. And um, so I think that it's not a, the part that's not a nuance is a really robust discussion about 
the funding structure of, of our museums in America. And I, I would also add to it, you know, what is the philosophy that underpins all of this? How do you make decisions when we're public institutions? I'm not saying you can't, I'm just saying, what, what is the philosophy that informs those decisions when we're public institutions? Whose politics do we align with? It's a, it's a, it's a fascinating question and one that deserves serious care. In a poll in Arts Journal, uh, readers said that the, about, about museums, the things that they were concerned about, 37% said funding, biggest issue, 24% said relevance, responding to change in the culture, and 15% said diversity. For each of you, you wanna take one of them and <laughs> tell me what you're doing, how you're handling it, how you're tackling one of those three issues. Funding, relevance, or diversity? Well, you found something which is relevant. <laughs> and relevancy <laughs> is diversity right now. <laughs> Content is the key. You cannot mm -hmm. transform a donkey into a horse. That's all. <laughs> How about you, Anne, of, of, those, of those three? <laughs> well, you know, relevance and um, diversity go hand in hand for us. You know, here we are as institutions that are storytellers. And how can we tell truthful, dignified stories if we don't have diversity? So for me, they go hand in hand. And so, you know, we're working at this at all levels within the institution, whether, you know, it's board, staff, we have a great, great diversity and equity uh, task force within the institution for the past few years, that's both board and staff combined. Um, and you see it in our exhibitions, you see it in our public programs, you see it in our educational efforts, you see it in our community reach. So, you know, this ethos is in the DNA of everything we do at the museum. I, I would certainly echo that the three are, are related. Um, I, you know, in thinking about my new role at, at the National Gallery of Art, it's the um, first museum that I have been a part of that is not um, entirely a community museum. I worked in Memphis and um, in Fresno, California and in Minneapolis. And those three museums really are um, absolutely focused on the local community. Um, we used to laugh in Minneapolis that we don't see people from outside of Minnesota between about um, October and May uh, because of the weather there. Um, and, uh, and as I was thinking about the opportunity of going to Washington, I said to one of my um, uh, trustees in, in Minneapolis that, uh, that it worried me because um, community museums feed my soul and what would it be like? And he said, yes, but at the National Gallery, the nation becomes your community. And what does that mean? And so that really excited me and got me thinking. And then sort of related to that, um, the collection of the National Gallery of Art is um, focused from the time of our founding on European art and American art. And again, I've always been part of institutions that have a broader collection than that. And so um, I've been really excited about thinking about then how, how do we um, really make use of this incredible collection that we have and think about relevance. And uh, shortly after arriving, I asked uh, two of our staff members to lead some uh, discussion groups about relevance in the institution. And I said, my only rule was that I didn't want it to be focused exclusively with uh, curators and educators. I wanted the whole um, staff to be able to participate if they wanted to. And so um, they uh, put out an announcement of a, a meeting about relevance and, um, and we had 450 people come out of a staff of um, 11, 1200. So, People were really I guess interested they wanted to, be asked. to talk about yeah. relevance, yeah. And um, you know, my selling. training, I went from ancient Greece and Rome to um, 17th century Holland. So um, my training is very firmly in old masters and in, in European art. And I, I believe passionately in the relevance of that collection and the ability to transcend um, time and place with the universality of um, what we've been talking about here about what makes us human. And so um, uh, I'm super excited at, at the National Gallery of Art about the further conversations and explorations we're gonna have about um, the relevance of a European and American collection in America today. So in fact, 
sorry. Uh, in fact, uh, we are talking about museum with exhibitions, collection, but culture okay, concerns all kind of aspects in our daily life. It's immigration, it's health, family, elders, okay, inclusion. Um, it's really uh, the heart of so many challenges we are facing right now. And in, I must say, and I can say that because uh, the OECD, and you don't know the OECD, but it is a worldwide economic organization. Economic organization. You know that, Kevin. Thank you. So, because it seems that in United States it's not so well known, but the OECD and the ICOM launched a guide uh, one year ago about the, how museums impact communities, municipalities, and government. So it's very interesting to see that economist considers museum as social asset. It's very, very important. You can find uh, this guide on your website. It is. So I, I just thought I would give a little texture to the conversation because it's easy to speak in generalities about, you know, it's in the ethos of all that we do. But, you know, I've, at the Brooklyn Museum, since I've been here, we've hosted some really major exhibitions. Uh, we wanted a revolution, black radical women, uh, radical women, Latin American, a lot of radical uh, Latin American art, um, soul of the nation, uh, legacy of lynching with equal justice initiative. But just to give you a sense, in the next week or two, we're opening five little but mighty collection shows. We have Kehinde Wiley's Napoleon Crossing the Alps, paired with Jacques Louis David's uh, painting of the same subject, dealing with issues of history painting, masculinity, power, but also a not so subtle institutional critique of what are the narratives that were traditionally valued, what are the narratives that we're valuing today, lifting up and celebrating. We have Jeffrey Gibson uh, with his work um, and our Native American collection, really in queering the idea of a Native American identity, one that is much more uh, generous and uh, about self-determination, really quite extraordinary. We have a show on climate and crisis, uh, looking uh, through the lens of our Native American collections in terms of the traditions and cultures of indigenous peoples in North America. We're centralizing African art by having um, objects from our African art collection in conversation with traditionally Western work, right? So you'll have an Ethiopian cross next to an Italian Renaissance painting. You'll have a Nigerian power mask next to a painting, by, a famous painting by Gilbert Stewart of George Washington. So all of these things are really disrupting the traditional museum model and really thinking much more proactively about this idea of contemporary relevance and connecting history to the present moment. Let's take some audience questions. How fun. Thank you. What advice would you give a young professional trying to work in the arts? What do you think? Work, 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 like Beyonce. <laughs> That's Rihanna. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, would, I would say that it's really important to be open-minded and to sit in conversation with people who may share different views than your own. You cannot succeed in business if you're not comfortable being in uncomfortable conversations. What keeps you up at night? I don't know if this is personally or professionally, but... <laughs> <laughs> I actually have these two cats that um, are so persistent at the door that we build a barricade with a 25 pound kettlebell weight against the door and then move pieces of furniture um, against the door and some nights they still get in. <laughs> Those are persistent cats. Uh -huh. Um, I would say that there's a culture of meanness right now. I love everything about my job, but this culture of meanness that's not based on facts, it's not based on conversation, and I think it's destructive to our democracy and our institutions. So that keeps me up at night. Notice the bags under my eyes? That's, <laughs> no, I don't. That's what it's about. <laughs> I, I, I made a joke about my cats, but, um, and I should never joke about my cats, but... Um, <laughs> 
I would also throw in something that we as museum directors talk a lot about is um, the uh, desire for a lot of our often engaged community members, our um, staff members, uh, for the relevance we've been talking about, for changing institutions, for greater diversity, and um, uh, the sort of challenge of that audience, which is very important, with also the audience that I refer to as our loyal stakeholders. They tend to be our older trustees and donors. They tend to be white. Um, and, and I often point out that I think for a lot of this group, they don't recognize changing America unless they're taking their grandchildren to elementary school and dropping them off and seeing how America is changing. And for a museum director, um, it, it's a very difficult um, balance between those very important audiences and stakeholders. I agree because I have five cats, by the way. <laughs> it's a collection. Um, but I agree with you, what uh, keep me uh, awake during the night, it's uh, the fact that now donc, uh, we can see our society so divided and uh, there is such a lack of debate and conversation. And I think that really our role is to be, to make bridges between generations, between fields, between publics, because we cannot, I'm sure that here, we all agree about the same values, I'm sure. Even if we go to vote, I'm sure that it will be almost the same thing. But what is important is to, to talk and to keep the conversation with the deep part of the, converse, uh, of the population. So this is what uh, keeps us awake. And I'm sure that it's the same for you, no? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I actually had the... Uh, benefit of um, uh, moderating a panel of esteemed librarians from major institutions in Washington and the East Coast not long ago. And I asked them the question. I said, so what keeps a librarian up at night? And they all said the same thing. They said mold. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the conservator answer in a North American museums might be moths, yeah. just so you know. Yeah. Bed bugs are also high on their list. <laughs> All right, someone who wants to ask a question about female leadership, because dang it, it was on the website. <laughs> um, considering that museums are mostly, ma uh, mostly male field, as female leaders, what are you doing at your institutions to help women succeed with regard to pay gap and better maternity leave, et cetera? I know that we wanted to avoid the gender uh, issue, but uh, when I saw the armchair. <laughs> These are my office chairs. But, Do you like them? But uh, someone from uh, your museum told me that uh, donc pink is not gender. OK. So uh, <laughs> but, um, well, I thought that we need more women, okay, and uh, we need to make uh, what is possible to have more women on our board. We have the parity in uh, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts right now, but also okay, it is so important uh, to have more women because it's not just a question of gender, it's a question of leadership, it's a question of um, a different way concerning empathy, concerning uh, or the way how we deal with power. And uh, it's very important to have this uh, balance uh, everywhere. I must say that cultural field is not so bad you know, for a woman, it's, but not so much uh, in uh, big museums. There are not so many uh, uh, women leaders. Uh, but if you consider you know, the companies, for-profit companies, in Canada, Canada, two-thirds of the companies do not have even a single woman on their board. It's really uh, a shame. I'd actually throw out a, 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 another concern is that our field is becoming so predominantly filled with women. And by field, I mean um, mus mus art museums and, and, um, and the arts and arts faculty. Um, at universities, and I worry about that because we're stronger the more diverse we are as institutions. So 
um, becoming entirely female is also not, not helpful. And, um, and of course, all studies show that when a profession becomes um, pink collar, whether it's color or not, um, that salaries go down. And, and so um, I'm very concerned about uh, making sure that we have more men in our field. Um, I would say um, for, for those of you who are young and concerned about pay equity within our institutions, you have every reason to be concerned about that. And I will say a little bit of good news is that in um, the conversations I have with colleagues um, here in New York and around the country, a lot of us are investing in outside consultants taking an objective look at our institutions to see where the inequities lie. And I think there's a lot of sincere action on the part of many of my colleagues to try to right historic wrongs. What efforts are being undertaken to increase racial diversity of museum leadership and boards beyond acknowledging the value of diversity? So, Welcome so we have York, a very Matt. diverse, we have a, we have a pretty diverse board actually um, at, at the Brooklyn Museum. And my predecessor, Arnold Lehman, was a great believer in diversity, that if we have diversity of thought and experience uh, and professions, professions, we're stronger. We can um, pave a path forward for the institution more successfully. That um, diversity continues to grow. It's a very intentional effort. But I think that sometimes institutions think that you can only have people with money on your board. And I think it's really important to remember that the board is there to help guide the museum in the present and toward a healthy, robust future. And you can't do that if you don't have lots of different people around the table. So professional expertise needs to be as valued as the financial uh, um, support that people bring. I'd c comment on the... For the field that uh, I've been involved with, the um, Association of Art Museum Directors, AMD, for um, 20 years now, and um, AMD about 12 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, um, really sat up and said, we've got to do something. When you look around this room of art museum directors, we're 98% um, you know, white. And, um, and as a sort of field, we really decided that we needed to, as a field, come together to work harder about the pipeline and what we're doing uh, to work with um, students from high school, college, um, on up to try to diversify the pipeline going forward, that that was the most important work that we could do to change the future. And uh, the recent move of the um, AMD announcing that, um, as a field, we were going to support paid internships at last um, was also, I think, a major development. Um, uh, I actually, uh, when I was in Minneapolis, a team of uh, our younger staff came to me and said, enough, we have to have paid internships. And I said, what? I was a free intern at the start of my career. You know, if this is what we do, we, you know, pay our dues for the field. And they looked at me and said, yes, and we're all going to look like you until we make a change. And, um, and you know, we, we heard them. So it, it, And it's exactly the same uh, situation in Canada, plus the indigenous uh, challenge, because, of course, we are in this policy of uh, uh, truth and reconciliation. And uh, we have, we must uh, make some effort in order to integrate, to include uh, indigenous uh, people on each level of our institution. So it's absolutely true that it's not a question of uh, acquisition, exhibition, but it's really among our staff like that we need to make uh, those changes. And uh, it will be done. It will be done because this is our century. It's not the future. It's now. But, you know, museums can't solve this by itself. Universities, for example, have to play a really major role. And I want to give a, a shout out to my friend um, Buffy Easton with the Center for Curatorial Leadership, who's been working really hard to help prepare the future generation of museum leaders by training the curatorial ranks. And um, they're having tremendous progress and impact. And at the same time, we just simply need more people uh, to choose to have careers in the arts, to get higher education to, uh, curatorial degrees, for example. But until we pay equitably, 
it's very hard for people to make those decisions. So there's a major shift, adjustment, that's going, beginning to go on in our field, I think, right now. This is interesting. You seem interested in impact. You all seem interested in impact. How are you including the stories of impact from participants in your planning and marketing? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a different example of impact, the one I like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so this fall, some of you may have read, we started a new initiative at the museum called Project Reset. It's a collaboration with the DA's office, the Brooklyn DA, and the Center for Court Innovation. And the, uh, and the idea is that when um, uh, people get picked up, primarily young people, but not exclusively young people, for small crimes like jumping the turnstile, maybe a little graffiti, maybe a little shoplifting, rather than clogging up the court system, having to pay bail, and if they can't pay bail, they end up in Rikers, and they have a record, and their lives are ruined, and their families' are, lives are disrupted, and their community lives are disrupted, et cetera, we understand the cycle, right? Um, that they do a two and a half hour class at the museum. Once they do that class, they don't have to go to the court system, their record is cleared, they pay no fine. They're forgiven. Imagine that in this country with a history of uh, getting worse and worse, a culture of punishment, that we actually forgive people. So, in the first year of this pilot program, we'll have kept 750 people out of the system. Wow. That's how I define impact. Well, we're almost out of time, so I want to ask sort of the last essay-ish question. <laughs> when you think about your personal goals as a leader, what are they? And what, what were some of your first steps to achieving those goals? I, I say my, um, you know, my role is to empower our staff to, to, to listen to them, to help remove roadblocks to achieving the great um, ideas and dreams that they have to help them find um, the resources and the opportunities to create them and then to get out of the way um, so that they can do it. Um, I would say that uh, the goal is really to, to bring culture as important as sport in our well-being. For me, it's, uh, I'm absolutely convinced that uh, culture and art will be considered as important for our, for our health as sport. Because one century ago, it was not at all obvious that sport was good for our body and our health. It was even criticized. But now, look, it's obvious for everybody, obviously. So um, I think that uh, having the well-being, having this social impact, and in Montreal, frankly, because it's not, it's, it's a city with 2.5 million, it's not so big uh, in comparison with New York, but we are working with 450 associations. So we receive 1.2 million people. Mm -hmm. so we have more than 100,000 members. Look, we receive, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a top five AMD membership. So the impact is so strong and you can see that there is a true um, effect on our society because uh, we, we work with, uh, for restorative justice, we work with uh, uh, medical doctors, we work against violence, uh, uh, with women, uh, et cetera, et cetera, 450 associations. And this is what a museum can do in his society. So uh, just maintaining and what is important that our politics should understand that our museums are not just for uh, blockbusters and collections and uh, fancy uh, contemporary art fairs. We are truly assets for our society. And uh, I hope that uh, it will be uh, understood by uh, think, uh, our fundraisers and politicians. Anne, what's your final word? Well, I guess I would say, um, you know, my father always said to me, endeavor to leave the planet a better place than you inherited. Obviously, one institution or one person or a field can't necessarily do that.
but I know that my board and my, my staff, my team here at the Brooklyn Museum, all feel passionately that we must do our very best to create more digni dignity and decency in the world. And so we do that one program at a time. Natalie Bondil, Kaywin Fellman, and Ann Pasternak. Thanks so much. Thank you, Allison. And thank you, Allison, for your moderation. And of course, thank you to all of you for joining us. If you're not a museum member, I just have to give a plug. Please consider joining. Uh, we love our members. You keep programs like this possible. And of course, we encourage you to come back to the museum. Like Anne mentioned, we have some really incredible shows opening next week. And this time, well, no, Thursday of next week, we have a few tickets left. We have a conversation with Kehinde Wiley and Hilton Owls. So don't miss out on that. And then, of course, you can pick up a program on your way out to learn about the other events that we have going on at the museum. Get home safe. Thanks so much for coming out.